as always, our uh, messages have been translated in different languages, and if you want to use the translations, they are available on our website. Simply scan the code. And for those of you who are joining us online, welcome. Really great to have you with us this morning. Now, we are halfway through our series 90. This morning's message is the 14th in a series with another 14 to go. By our standards, a fairly long series. But just to encourage you, uh, in my 20s, I attended a church where the pastor was doing the, a series on the New Testament book of Romans, and that lasted just over four years. So, 28 messages presented on Sunday and Wednesdays online. Hey, doesn't sound so bad. <clears throat> now, this past Wednesday, Matt shared with us um, an overall picture of some of the miracles uh, performed by Jesus. And during his earthly ministry, Jesus performed miracles by touching, by healing, transforming countless lives. He overcame the laws of nature and he even raised the dead, proving that he has the power over life and death. <clears throat> like other events in the life of Jesus, these miracles have been recorded by eyewitnesses and recorded in the biblical account for us. And this morning, we're going to focus on just one miracle. Uh, this miracle is found in the three Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, each of the authors gives a, the same story, um, but with different details and a flavor as if it were. So if you want to read to get the full picture, um, during the week have a look at these three um, Gospels and see um, the, full, the, the full picture as if it were. Um, this is something I really have to encourage you to do. But for this morning, uh, we're going to use one the Gospel, the Gospel of Mark, for our study. So let's listen to the passage. The reading is taken from Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 34. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders, named Jairus, came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. The story of this woman is one of the most moving that we find in the gospel. There is hardly a person who cannot relate with struggling with something for a long time. There's hardly a person who does not know what it's like to to find themselves in a desperate situation where there seems to be no end, no escape. This account does contain, though, a number of encouraging lessons to help us strengthen our faith when we find ourselves in such situations. Now, the, the account unfolds 
not too far from the Sea of Galilee. Jesus has gone with his disciples to that part of the country. Um, Jesus was teaching when he's approached by a man who is identified as a worker in the local synagogue. <clears throat> he came to Jesus in distress, begging him to visit his home where his 12-year-old daughter um, was dying. And, and we, today we can't even begin to imagine what this man was experiencing. Living at a time when there was so little that medical professionals could do, it would be in people's minds that this girl would die. <clears throat> Jesus responds, and uh, he began to walk with this man to go to his home. And the crowd that he was teaching, well, they, they, they went with him. Um, you can begin to sense excitement in them. Um, they're about to see another miracle. I mean, this is the main reason why they came to see him. This is the main reason why they follow him. And as he moves along the crowd, the crowd got bigger and closer and closer to him, to the point where Jesus was being pressed from every different direction. Um, for those of you who enjoy or played or enjoyed rugby, think of a scrum and you begin to get the idea. Now the text tells us that among the crowd that is surrounding Jesus, there was a woman who had been um, seeking to be delivered from a 12-year illness. Now, verse 24 tells us, a large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. <clears throat> Some say that the name of this woman was Veronica, but this information is basically just tradition more than anything else. It can never be proved. What we do know is that she had a medical problem, medical condition, that had caused her to bleed for 12 long, long years. And her journey of, for healing took her to every doctor she knew, and she tried every possible cure, whether genuine or not. And in doing so, the Bible tells her that she spent all her money and she finds herself in a position where she's got nothing left. Jesus is her last hope. So she crept behind Jesus in this crowd, believing that she just touched his clothes, she would receive healing. And she did. This is what verse 29 says. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. And she felt in her body she was freed from her suffering. And as soon as she receives healing, Jesus stops dead in his tracks and says, Who touched me? Verse 30. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out of him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding around you, the disciples answered. And yet, you ask, you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept on looking around to see who had done it. <clears throat> and this woman was both afraid and ashamed to come forward. But as Jesus keeps on looking and then gives her his attention, she explains everything that happened to her. Verse 33, then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole story, the whole truth. And Jesus responds positively, telling her that her faith has healed her. Verse 34, he, Jesus, said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. <clears throat> now, before we get into the lessons that we can learn from this woman and from this passage, let's look at one or two of her qualities. What is it that makes her stand out to us as such a great example to follow? Well, to start with, she was a risk taker. She went against the rules of her time to reach for the healing and the blessing from God. She had imperfect, yes, but unwavering faith. Uh, she had some beliefs that were not quite true because of a cultural background, but she trusted Jesus' power. Then she persevered. There were hundreds, probably thousands of people around Jesus. She had to force a way um, so that she could get close to Jesus, and this could have led her to a lot of trouble. She did it anyway. She was desperate. She was fearful 
but faith filled. After she touched Jesus and he turns around, the Bible says that she came trembling to Jesus. She may not have been the most courageous person, but she had enough faith to step out and touch Jesus. So this is the story in the Bible of a woman with a bleeding condition. And I suppose the question that we could ask ourselves this morning is really a very simple one. Uh, what can we learn from this account? Some brief points I want to share with you this morning to encourage your new faith in God. That's the first one. Faith sometimes requires risk. Faith requires risk. This woman took a huge risk. To understand uh, this, you have to know what the Bible says about this woman's bleeding. In the Jewish culture, her bleeding disorder <clears throat> rendered her unclean. Everything and anyone she touched was unclean. And according to the law, she was not permitted to handle money or food or attend uh, services in synagogue or in fact be in any open space. She really should not be physically close to anyone and certainly not in a crowd. What she did, she was exposing her, the crowd around her to the fact that she was unclean and that was a crime punishable by law. This is, may well be why she came to Jesus looking for healing secretly. But she risked her life in doing so to access the healing of God. And that's probably one of the most outstanding characteristics of this woman. She was willing to go on a limb for her faith. Now, her illness was somewhat common among women uh, of the day and difficult to cure. But she persisted. She, to the extent that she was ready to risk everything she had so that she could find healing. If you find yourself in a desperate situation, whatever that situation may be, maybe safety isn't where the breakthrough lies. Maybe he's taking a risk. Maybe he's stepping out in faith. Then we also learn that from this passage that faith does capture God's attention. Have you ever wondered, like the disciples, how in the world Jesus knew that this woman had touched him? When Jesus asked, who touched me? The disciples thought, this is a ridiculous question, and they were right. After all, he was in a crowd. Everyone was touching him. In fact, the word used in the original to describe the crowd means that Jesus was really being suffocated by so many people. As he walked, he could hardly breathe because so many people pressing so close to him. So how did he discern this particular touch? Let's do a brief study of the word used here. As I said, the word that we find in the text means to fasten to or to cling to. And when Jesus asked, who's touching me? He was not referring to the act of somebody putting their hand on him. It was a lot more than that. In fact, the story tells us that she didn't even touch Jesus. She only touched his clothes. And yet Jesus asked, who touched me? What Jesus was really asking was, who clung to me with their whole being in unwavering faith? You see, this woman was in a desperate situation. And because of that, she clung to God. She put her faith in God. Many people in the crowd had put their hands on Jesus. But this woman was the only who truly touched God at that moment. Her faith was so strong that it reached God deeply, more than anyone else in that crowd. Faith does capture the attention of God. And then God's attention to our faith is not divided. And this is something I really, really like. This account tells us that when God gives us his attention, is never multitasking. A faith as deep as we find in this woman not only earned, gets God's attention, but it secures his undivided attention. After the woman identified herself, 
Jesus focuses on her only, and he listens intently to her as she tells the story. He listened as she described the horrible condition and burden that she had experienced for 12 years. The scorn that she had suffered, the loneliness that she experienced, the desperation that she felt day after day after day. And yet, and in spite of the massive crowd around Jesus, it seems that no one existed apart from this woman in those moments. There is no detail of how long it took for her to tell the story and what she experienced, but it did not matter. Jesus did not hurry her along, although a little girl was on the brink of death. It's not that he didn't care for this little girl. Jesus did not hurry because, after all, he has life and death in his hands. And that moment, this woman needed him. And he was fully present for her. And then from this passage, we see that God works with less and perfect faith. This woman had faith, but he was somewhat mingled with cultural background and ideas and so on. Um, she, when she reasoned, when she thought, if I just touch his clothes, um, this referred to the popular um, superstition uh, of the moment of that day that a person's powers could be transmitted through their clothes. Uh, in Jesus' case, when she talked about the hem of his cloak, uh, as Matthew, Matthew tells us, uh, she was talking particularly about a, a Jewish practice. Um, rabbis and every devout Jew had an outer garment, and at the bottom there were some small balls of, of wool, and they're normally blue in color. Um, they indicated that they were part of the Jewish culture. They were the people chosen by God. And it's one of these little bits of material that she wanted to touch. But notice Jesus' response to her. Daughter, your faith has healed you. And stating this so implicitly, Jesus was addressing a superstition. He wanted her to know that there was no power in the clothes, that the real answer came because she had faith in God. And it was through her faith that she was receiving healing. And although Jesus knew that her faith was mixed up with cultural backgrounds and so on, he met her where she was. Her faith was accepted, even though it was imperfect. Let me ask you this morning, do you want to touch the hem of Jesus' clothing? But you feel you're just not good enough, not perfect enough? You don't have to perfect, or you don't have to be perfect in your faith to access the blessings of heaven. What you need is that step of abiding faith that God will do what he says he will. And then when Jesus heals, it is complete. And I'm not simply talking about physical healing here because often we don't see that. But think of the following. Because of the Jewish rules about bleeding and the social stigma associated uh, with this disease, she was not able to enjoy any human relationships. Okay. She was isolated from a religious community. There was a belief that illness was a way of God's punishing people and sin. And so there was really a great chance that she was shunned by her family and disowned by her father. And as a woman in that society, this was so extremely vulnerable, such a bad place to be. She had no one to care for her. She had no one to speak up for her. This may well be the reason why Jesus calls her daughter, to indicate that she was being restored. For so long, she had been an outcast, ostracized, defined by her illness. The self-worth would have been trampled on. The isolation would have been caused her to get used to being invisible to everybody else. But Jesus assures her that she belongs. She belongs to him. And she might have no one else to care for her, but now he did. And her physical healing would not only allow her to find freedom, 
but to resume social interaction, to participate in worship services, to get a job, maybe even get married and have children, something that she would have not been able to have. <coughs> Pardon me, but there is more. Verse 34, he said to her, <clears throat> Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. A better translation of the original would be, go into peace. And as so many of you know, the words, the Jewish word for peace, for Jewish person, this would mean not simply an absence of trouble, but the sense of well-being, welfare, and safety for an individual or a country. A sense of being at peace with oneself and with worlds. And that's what Jesus is saying to this woman. Experience the sense of peace. If you stop to think of it, rather than just reading the passage, this is such a moving story. In the beginning, we're introduced to a woman, and all we can do is to feel sorry for her. The past 12 years have really, really been tough on her. But by the end of the story, there is a sense of good that we can experience because we see that God is at work. And there are so many lessons that we can learn from the experience of this woman. God rewards those who stretch towards heaven in faith. He responds to authentic faith, even if it's not perfect. His attention is never divided for those who trust in him. And when God heals, he touches every area of our lives. We set aside the Sunday to pray for healing for one another. We have done so because we believe that God still heals today, be it physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritual healing. And if you find yourself in a situation similar to this woman, whatever the cause may be, if you find yourself in such a situation this morning, maybe this morning the Bible is saying to you, Take a risk. Step out in faith. In a figurative way, an invitation to touch the hem of Jesus' clothing. It's not about being perfect before you come to God. It's not about having resolved every problem in your life. It's knowing that it's not about you and about what you're able to do and not do. It's about where your heart is in your relationship with God. You don't have to be perfect to access the blessings of heaven. A deep abiding faith is what God wants from us. In a few moments, we're going to have communion. And then we're going to offer prayer for anyone who may want to receive prayer. Communion time allowing us to come before God and to look at the relationship with him. And where necessary to confess and to be open to what he's saying to us. And then pray. Praying for one another, stepping out in faith, asking God to bring healing and comfort where it's needed. But first, Ross and our worship team are going to lead us in a time of song of worship. And as we sing, I'd like to invite you to see this not simply as a time when we all sing together, but as a time that we can put aside everything and everybody else, just put them aside. And for these brief moments, to allow God to be the center of our attention, of our worship, and our adoration. Thank you, Ross.